Hello there future ACCAs, I welcome you all to the first session of the Audit and Assurance paper. I'm a proud friend from Vishnu Vijay and I will be guiding you through this audit journey. So folks, I know that you're all really excited to kickstart the AA syllabus, so I'm not going to waste any time. Let's take a look at the first syllabus area that is Audit Framework and Regulation. So what exactly are we learning in this particular syllabus area? In this syllabus area, we will be learning the basics of auditing. Now, I know that for some of you, the concepts of auditing might be entirely new. However, there might also be some of you who might have already learned the concepts relating to auditing from your graduation courses or any other professional courses, or you might even be an audit professional working for a firm as well, isn't it? However, what you have to understand here is that the ACC examiner has a specific method into testing the concepts of auditing in the ACC exam. Okay, folks, so what we have to do is we have to become compatible with that technique, isn't it? So that is exactly what we will be covering through our video lectures in our revision bootcamp as well as our question marathon as well. Okay, folks, so keep that in mind. Now, our objective here is to learn the audit language, isn't it? And how are we doing that? We will learn that by learning everything from scratch, from the basics so that we can tackle any question that can come up in the exam with these. Okay, folks, that's basically our objective here. Now, let's get started with this particular syllabus area, shall we? In this particular syllabus area, we are focusing on two things. Firstly, we will be learning about the audit framework. Okay, so what exactly is the audit framework all about? Well, let's first of all talk about the word here, framework. What does that mean? Well, Let's say if you're planning to construct a particular building, what exactly is the first thing that you construct? Is it the doors, the windows? No, not really, not necessarily, isn't it? You have to construct the foundation of that particular building, isn't it? So the framework is, can be compared to the foundation of a building, okay, folks, because the foundation of the building sets the limits upon which the entire building is built, isn't it? So just like that, the audit framework sets the limits upon which the entire auditing standards and other relevant rules and regulations are built upon. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what an audit framework is all about. And then we look at the regulation aspect. Of course, audit is a profession and it is regulated with a number of standards and rules, isn't it? That is exactly what we will be learning in that aspect of this particular syllabus. Okay, folks, so first of all, we have to learn the basics of auditing as to what audit is and what are the basic concepts relating to it, isn't it? So that is exactly what we have lined up for this session. Okay, folks, so first of all, we will be learning as to what audit and assurance is all about. Secondly, we will be learning the five elements of assurance engagement. Okay, folks, of course, we will also learn as to what assurance engagement is as well. And then we will learn about the objectives of an audit. Then we will learn a concept known as true and fair view. Okay, folks, so what you have to understand is that throughout these sessions, you will be learning a lot of technical terms. Okay, folks, so these terms are really relevant for your exam as well as for you as an audit professional as well. Okay, folks, because this is how you learn the audit language. Because there is a language particularly to audit, which you will understand when we, uh, you know, complete the syllabus area and we start practicing questions as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And then we will learn about the type of assurance engagements. Okay, so there are certain types of uh, assurance engagement. We will learn about that. We will look at, look at the levels of assurance. We will look at the benefits and drawbacks of an audit because definitely uh, everything has its own pros and cons, isn't it? Even audit. So we will learn about that. Then we will look at some general principles for an auditor to follow. And finally, we will learn some te uh, technical terms known as accountability, stewardship and agency. Okay, folks, so that is the lineup for this session. So I know that you're all really excited to begin. So let's take a look at the first topic that is audit and assurance. So what is audit all about here exactly? When we talk about audit, we're primarily talking about external audit. Okay, folks, there's also a concept known as internal audit, but that's something that we would discuss in an other session. Okay, folks, so what exactly is external audit all about? Let me illustrate that concept in an example. Okay, folks. Now, what I want you to remember is your school days, basically. Okay, folks. So, so I know that you're a bit nostalgic as of now. However, 
To be more specific, I want you to remember the exams conducted during your school days. Nostalgia ruined, isn't it? So, however, what exactly happens during an exam? Well, we have a tutor assigned to you to supervise your exam and there is you, the student, isn't it? So the tutor is going to provide you with a question paper and you would have to provide your answers in an answer sheet, isn't it? And then what we have to do is we have to provide the answer sheet back to the tutor so that they can correct and provide a test score. That's basically as to what happens in a particular exam, isn't it? So keep this factor in mind, okay, folks. Now, what I want you to think is this. If a particular student was told that they had to correct their own answer sheet, do you think that there would be a problem there? Yes, there most definitely will be a problem, isn't it? What exactly is the problem? There is a risk that the particular student may overstate the test score, isn't it? To his own, his or her own advantage, isn't it? So that's basically the risk of this happening, isn't it? Which is exactly why the answer sheet is provided back to the tutor so that that particular person can correct the particular answer and provide a more reliable test score, isn't it? So that's basically the situation what, so what happens in an exam. So just like this, we have something similar happening in the business organizations as well. Okay, folks, what happens here is, when it comes to the business organization, we have a person known as the auditor, as well as the management of an organization. Okay, folks. So instead of a tutor, we have an auditor and instead of a student, we have a manage management of an organization. Okay, folks. So instead of an answer sheet, the management prepares the financial statements. Okay, folks, the financial statements. So, what exactly is the idea here? Well, since the management prepares the financial statements on their own, isn't there a possibility that the management can maybe overstate the profits or revenues or the assets of the firm? Yes, there is, isn't it? So in order to avoid such a risk, what we do is we conduct something called an audit where we review the financial statements and understand as to whether the financial statements are prepared in an appropriate manner. Okay, folks, that is basically as to what an audit is all about. So the auditor reviews the financial statement and provides something called an opinion. Okay, folks, they don't provide any test scores or rank. Instead, what they do is they provide an opinion on the financial statements. So keep this in mind. Okay, folks, this is the audit process as to what it is all about. Okay, folks, an auditor reviews the financial statements and provide an opinion as to whether the financial statements are prepared appropriately or not. As simple as that. Okay, folks. So that's basically the concept behind external audit, to put it very simply. Now, let's speak on more on that, shall we? Let's take a look at the material. An external audit is a type of assurance engagement. Okay, so that's a relevant point right there. What is an assurance engagement? We will look into that. However, what you have to understand for now is that assurance engagement is a broader concept and external audit is just a type of assurance engagement, as simple as that. Okay, folks, and that is carried out by an auditor. Okay, so an audit is carried out by an auditor, which is kind of obvious, isn't it? To give an independent opinion. Okay, folks, there is a key word that you have to learn here that is independent opinion. The opinion provided by a particular auditor is always independent in nature, which means that they are not influenced by any sort of interest. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Now, what else? On a, on a set of financial statements. Okay, so we provide uh, an auditor basically provides an independent opinion on the financial statement. That's basically as to what an audit process is. Now, when we talk about financial statements, what all documents are we, uh, you know, talking about exactly? Well, the financial statements basically include five documents, isn't it? So what are these five documents? We have the statement of profit and loss. We are, and, and of course, other comprehensive income as well. And then we have the statement of financial position, the statement of cash flows, the statement of changes in equity, as well as finally, we have the notes to financial statements as well, isn't it? So these are the 
as to what consists of the, consists the financial statement as simple as that okay folks so that's basically as to what the audit process is all about however there are a few more things that i'd like to explain here that is first of all what you have to understand is that audit is a process conducted by a team of auditors okay folks it is a teamwork okay, folks so keep that in mind so audit is a process we obviously know that and then what you have to understand is that it's not a one-man process okay folks audit is not a process conducted by a single individual there is a team of auditors who conduct the audit work so keep that in mind and another aspect is since it is a process it should have a methodology to it isn't it okay folks there is a step-by-step -step process involved in this uh, audit uh, audit process so what exactly is that step-by-step -step process well, it can be, you know, different in di for different audits. However, let me just explain the simple few things that we have, com have in common in all audits. Okay, folks. So first of all, what we do is we understand the organization that we are auditing. Okay, folks. Understand. Let me just write it over here. Understand the organization and its environment so that is the first thing that we do and after that what we do is we plan the audit okay folks so in planning we do a lot of stuff and we will learn about all the stuff all these things as to what we do in the planning phase and all other steps in detail in the next few sessions as well okay folks so keep this in mind so after understanding the organization and its environment we plan the audit we're conducting something called something called uh, risk assessment and uh, identify materiality uh, plan the steps that needs to be conducted or uh, when when the audit should be completed etc all these things are planned in advance we set budgets as well here and after that we implement the audit isn't it so we conduct audit procedures and of course there are various types of procedures as well we will learn about all of these okay folks so keep this in mind and finally we conduct something called the review and reporting stage we enter a stage known as the review and reporting stage so in the review and reporting stage what we do is we review our own work okay folks after planning the audit and conducting the procedures and conducting the audit process itself we review the work that we've done that is basically as to what review means and then we report it okay folks what exactly is reporting all about are we preparing the financial statements yet again no not really that's not the thing okay folks in reporting what we mean is as i stated earlier the auditors provide an opinion isn't it so they don't orally provide the opinion to the management okay folks rather they prepare a report known as the auditor's report then that is where they would provide their opinion regarding the financial statement okay folks that is what reporting is all about so you will learn about each and every aspect of these steps throughout the syllabus of audit and assurance so keep that in mind okay folks now moving on <clears throat> with the objective of an audit so what exactly is the objective of an audit here which is something similar as to what we've learned in the definition of external audit as well that is the objective of an audit of financial statements is to enable the auditor to express an opinion on whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework okay so quite a few technical terms we just read here isn't it so what exactly does each of these mean well we already read about this particular portion so let's leave that be and another aspect to it is that what exactly is the auditor ensuring here? They're ensuring as to whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. So what exactly are we ensuring here? We're basically, to put it in simple terms, we're ensuring that the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with all the IFR standards, IA standards, and any local standards, if there, uh, if there is any, etc. Because that's basically the thing here. Has, have we prepared, has the management prepared the financial statements 
in accordance with all the relevant uh, accounting accounting standards and all the relevant uh, laws and regulations in the jurisdiction etc that is basically what we are making sure here okay folks to so keep this in mind now so you have to learn these technical terms that we point out here that is uh, what all technical terms have we learned up until now? We've learned that the auditor provides an independent opinion. Okay, and what else? We learned as to what the financial statement is. We will we learned as to what applicable financial reporting framework is all about as well, isn't it? What is that? That's basically the accounting standards and other standards we have to comply in order to prepare the financial statement. As simple as that. Now, another really relevant information that you have to understand throughout the entire syllabus of uh, AA is that. <clears throat> there is a difference between who prepares the financial statements and who audits it. Okay, folks, we all know that the people who conducts the audit on financial statements are basically the auditors, isn't it? However, what about the preparer? Who exactly has the responsibility to prepare the financial statement? Is it the auditors? No. Okay, folks, the auditors do not have the responsibility to prepare the financial statements. Instead, this particular responsibility lies with the management. Okay, folks, management of that particular audit client is what we use. Okay, folks, so the company we are auditing, because that particular company will definitely have a management and that management is responsible for preparing that organization's financial statement. So keep this in mind. Okay, folks. So another aspect that you have to learn is the difference between an audit client. So these are some technical terms that you have to remember throughout the audit syllabus. So there is the difference between the audit client and the audit firm. So the audit firm is where the group of auditors work. Okay, folks, this is where we have the our audit team that's basically as to what the uh, audit firm is all about and what about the audit client this is the client that the audit firm audits as simple as that okay folks so the organization in which we conduct the audit for is known as the audit client and the people who uh, people who conduct or the firm that conducts the audit is known as the audit firm so keep this in mind so simple simple terms and responsibilities isn't it so keep this in mind moving on to the next concept that is <clears throat> we have a term known as assurance engagement isn't it and we've learned that external audit is basically a type of assurance engagement okay so what exactly is an assurance engagement let's take a look at that shall we Assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient appropriate evidence in order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Okay, so that was quite the definition, isn't it? So, uh, if we can't really learn this definition on its own, what we can do is we can use an easier approach, which is to break down the definition. Okay, folks, so let's break down this de definition and learn it aspect by aspect, shall we? So first of all, let's take a look at this portion of the definition. Assurance engagement is an engagement. Well, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? So what engagement are we talking about? This is basically an engagement between two or more individuals of a business nature. Okay, folks, not of a romantic nature or anything. So it's just a business engagement. And what does it involve exactly? Here we have, uh, in this particular engagement, we have an individual known as the practitioner. Okay, folks, that's the first individual we have, which we have to learn about, the practitioner. So, who is the practitioner? As we talked about earlier, assurance engagement is a broader term than uh, uh, the term that is external audit. And external audit is a type of assurance engagement, isn't it? So, if we apply the concept of external engagement here, who exactly is the practitioner? The practitioner is basically the auditor himself. He works, that's basically it. And uh, this practitioner, what he does is he obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay, folks, the practitioner, or in the case of an audit, the auditor obtains sufficient and appropriate 
evidence. Now, what does this mean? This is yet again another keyword that you have to learn and which we will frequently use throughout the syllabus. So what is sufficient and appropriate evidence all about? Well, to put it simply, we know that the auditor or the practitioner will collect evidence to back their conclusion, isn't it? Because if we are providing a conclusion or an opinion, we would definitely need something or we would definitely need the evidence to back our opinion as to why we have provided such an opinion, isn't it? So that's exactly as to what they're doing here. However, it is specifically mentioned that the evidence should be sufficient and appropriate. Now, what does this mean? Sufficient basically means that the evidence should be of the appropriate quantity and appropriate basically means that the evidence should be of the appropriate quality. Okay, folks. So, if you are collecting the evidence, then we should collect evidence of the appropriate quantity as well as quality. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. That's basically as to what we have in the first part of this definition. Okay, so the practitioner collects sufficient appropriate uh, evidence. Why exactly is this done? Well, let's take a look. In order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party. Okay, so why exactly are we collecting the evidence here so that we can <clears throat> provide a conclusion, isn't it? So that we can provide a conclusion. So in the case of audit, this conclusion is basically the opinion that we provide. Okay, folks, in order to back our opinion, we collect evidence. So in order to back our conclusions, we collect sufficient and appropriate evidence, as simple as that. Now, let's move on to the other aspect to it. Okay, folks, who are we providing this conclusion for anyway? Because we are obviously working for someone, isn't it? Who are we working for exactly? These people are known as the intended users. Okay, folks, in the audit, these are basically the users of the financial statements. There could be primarily the shareholders, and of course, there are also other stakeholders as well. Okay, folks, which is the general, it could be the general public, it could be the customers, suppliers, employees, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Now, we uh, provide the conclusion for people known as the intended users, isn't it? intended users of the financial statement that's basically as to what the intended users are and this particular conclusion that we provide will increase the degree of confidence of these intended users in it increase the degree of confidence as well so keep this in mind okay folks we are breaking down that uh, complex definition i would say it's not that complex but yeah, it's basically a simple uh, step by step process. So we're just breaking it down into process by process and understanding as to what this definition means. Okay, folks. So up until now, we identified that there is someone known as a practitioner in this engagement, and then they collect sufficient and appropriate evidence to provide a conclusion that increases the level of confidence of the intended user. And there's another set of words right next to the intended users, which is other than the responsible party. Okay, folks, other than the responsible party. Now, who is the responsible party here? Responsible party. So, folks, in the case of an audit, the responsible party is basically the management of the organization, the people who are responsible for preparing the financial statements, as simple as that. Okay, folks, that is basically as to who the responsible party is all about. So, we provide the conclusion primarily for the intended users and not the responsible party, isn't it? So that's basically something that we pointed it out here. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, what else? About the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Okay, so for what is the item from which we, or, or why exactly are we collecting uh, evidence for to provide a conclusion. Okay, so what are we providing the conclusion on? Anyway, we provide the conclusion or we provide the opinion on the financial statement, isn't it? And this financial statement is basically what we call here as the subject matter. Okay, folks, subject matter. So we provide the conclusion on the subject matter and we uh, and how exactly are we providing that opinion by conducting an evaluation of the subject matter against 
criteria, isn't it? So there is a criteria that we've set up, which is basically, you know, the financial statement, uh, let's say uh, the accounting standards, the IFRS standards, IAS standards, the local accounting standards, laws and regulations, etc. All these things can be said to be the criteria. Okay, folks, we're comparing the subject matter that the financial statements against these uh, standards and criteria and ensuring that we've complied with everything. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what this last uh, last set of sentences or last set of words is all about. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, <clears throat> so what do we do here? We communicate the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of the subject matter done against the criteria. That's basically it. Okay, folks, now let's sum it all up, shall we? Let's read it again. And this time when we read this particular definition, let's read it from an audit perspective to give, gain a bit more understanding, shall we? So, I'm just going to switch a few words to something that we already learned. Let's take a look at that. Assurance engagement is, uh, sorry, assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner or in other words, the auditor obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence in order to express an opinion uh, designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the users of financial statements, primarily the shareholders or other stakeholders, other than the management about the outcome of evaluation of measurement of the financial statements against the criteria set that is the standards. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Okay, folks, it's basically a complex version of explaining the audit process, isn't it? If you think about it, that's basically it. Okay, folks, there's no, uh, too, nothing complex about it. It's basically a step by step explanation as to what happens in an audit. Because as we know, assurance engagement is a broader concept and Audit is basically, or external audit to be more precise, is a type of assurance engagement. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, so we learned about three parties here, isn't it? The practitioner. We already said that the practitioner is basically the auditor himself. What about the intended users? The users of financial statement. And who is the responsible party? The uh, management, isn't it? That's basically it. Okay, folks. So now, Let's take a look at the five elements stated in that definition of assurance engagement. So what all things or what all keywords were stated there? Well, in order to memorize that, I know that there are a lot of things that you need to remember in your life and definitely you might forget a few things here and there, isn't it? So I've prepared a memory aid here that will help you memorize as to what the five elements of assurance engagement are known as CREST. Okay, folks, C-R-E-S-T. Now, let me just quickly uh, explain as to what these are there we go so c stands for criteria okay folks and what is the criteria this is basically the criteria against which the subject matter is evaluated okay folks basically in the case of audit these are basically the ifr standards ia standards etc and then r stands for the report not just any report a written report uh, which basically contains the opinion of the practitioner. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what report here means. Then we have E, which stands for evidence. Okay, so is it just evidence? No, not really. Okay, folks, it is sufficient and appropriate evidence because the evidence that we collect in the assurance engagement or in the external audit should be of the sufficient quantity and of the appropriate quality as well. Okay, folks. And then we have S. And what does S stands for? S is basically the subject matter. Okay, folks. Subject matter on which we conduct the audit on. As simple as that. And finally, we have T that is three parties. These are basically the three parties that are involved in the uh, assurance engagement process. Who are the three parties? These are basically the practitioner, the uh, intended user, as well as the responsible party as well. Okay, folks. So, who is the practitioner here? Basically, in the case of an audit, it's basically the auditor. In the uh, And what about the intended users? The users of the subject matter. Or in other words, in the, in the case of an audit, the users of the financial statement. The shareholders, the general public, the employees, the customers, suppliers, finance providers, tax authorities, etc. All these people come under users of financial statements, isn't it? So, remember that. And then we have responsible party who is the people who are responsible for preparing the financial statement or the subject matter. Who is that in the case of an audit? The management. Okay, folks, not the auditor, the management. So remember that. Now, 
So let's quickly take a look at the material, shall we? So we have criteria. What is criteria? Criteria involves the criteria that is used to judge the reliability and accuracy of the subject matter. For example, IFR. So if we are preparing the financial statement, we should definitely prepare it using the uh, relevant accounting standards, isn't it? So have we prepared it correctly as per the standards? Well, we should, as the auditor, we should be uh, responsible for making sure about regarding that, isn't it? So that's basically the aspect here. Okay, so that's basically as to what criteria is. Okay, well, it's just the applicable financial reporting framework and other related aspects. So keep this in mind. Then we have the report, which basically explains that the report is given to the intended user by the practitioner stating the auditor's opinion and conclusions on the subject matter. So the particular conclusion, it's not necessarily communicated ver verbally, isn't it? So we don't just open a, a door to the particular board of directors and just announce our opinion, isn't it? So we just provide it in a written report. And this written report is known as the audit report. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, what else? Then we talk about evidence. Okay, so what is the idea behind evidence here? Evidence is required in order to back up the conclusions provided by the practitioner, which is the auditor. The evidence collected should be of sufficient quantity and should have the appropriate quality as well. As we mentioned earlier, isn't it? So the evidence should always be sufficient and appropriate. Okay, folks, these set of words should be used together. Okay, folks, and we will be frequently using these set of words throughout the syllabus as well. So remember that. And then what else? Then we have subject matter as well. Okay, so what is the subject matter here? Basically the financial statement. However, there are various other assurance engagement as well, isn't it? So it can, the subject matter can differ in various uh, assurance engagement depends upon what exactly we're examining. So keep this in mind. The matter that is provided by the responsible party on which assurance is given. Okay, folks, what is assurance then? Well, this is basically the level of confidence or the conclusion that we provide. Okay, folks, when we provide our conclusion or our opinion, then we are assuring something, isn't it? So we are assuring that the subject matter or the financial statement is a bit more reliable, isn't it? So that's basically as to why we use the term assurance here. Okay, folks, to so keep this in mind. Now, <clears throat> so we provide the assurance over a subject matter and uh, who exactly is responsible for preparing it? The responsible party. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. In the case of an external audit, the financial statement is the subject matter. So keep this in mind. Now, what else? Then we have the uh, fifth element of assurance engagement, that is three parties. It's not third party. Okay, folks, some students get, tend to get confused with this. Okay, folks, it's not third party. It is three parties. So who are the three parties involved here? The intended user, the responsible party, and the practitioner usually the shareholder but uh, the intended users are usually the shareholders but there are other stakeholders as well uh, the are uh, the ones who need assurance on the subject matter <clears throat> to make of course certain decisions for example finance providers such as banks and other financial institutions may use the uh, you know audited financial statements in order to uh, make decisions as to whether to provide loans to that particular organization or not isn't it so that's basically the case that has been stated here so keep this in mind and then we have yeah responsible party the people who are responsible for preparing the subject matter and finally practitioner who conducts the audit or conducts the particular uh, practice on the particular uh, financial statements okay well, they review the financial statements and provide their opinion that's basically it now so these are basically the three parties involved in an assurance engagement and how do you memorize the five elements of assurance engagement using the word using the mnemonic crest okay, folks c is for criteria r is for report e is for evidence not just any evidence sufficient and appropriate evidence and then we have our ess isn't it s stands for subject matter and t stands for three parties as simple as that now moving on to the next topic that is objectives of an audit so folks there are primarily three objectives that we have to learn regarding audit okay folks so what is the objective of an audit basically the objective of an auditor isn't it so what exactly is the objective of an auditor then let's learn about that shall we objectives of an audit so basically we focus on three relevant areas here and the first objective is to make sure as to whether the financial statements are prepared in something called the true and fair view. Okay, folks, is the financial statement is prepared in a 
true and fair manner. Okay, folks, that's basically the first thing that we focus on. And we will discuss the concept of true and fair view a bit shortly as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, second objective is that we have to make sure that the accounting records, accounting records are accurate and complete. Okay, folks. So, what exactly is the difference between financial statements and accounting records here then? Financial statements are basically the SOPL, the SOFP, the statement of uh, changes in equity, statement of cash flows, as well as notes to financial statement, isn't it? What about the uh, accounting records? What exactly are the accounting records then? Well, how exactly is the financial statements prepared? First of all, when a transaction is occurred in a particular business, so this is we are basically going back to the basics of accounting here, isn't it? So uh, the first thing that we do is we record a transaction and we uh, create journal entries, isn't it? So we record transaction using journal entries and these journals are classified into ledgers and from ledgers we prepare our trial balance and then we prepare our financial statements, isn't it? So keep this in mind and why exactly are we preparing a trial balance or what is the objective behind preparing a trial balance? Well, most students don't know this, but, uh, but let me explain as to why we do that. Okay, folks, we prepare a trial balance just to identify the accuracy of financial statement, which basically means that is the debit equals credit. That's basically it. Okay, folks, you know, to ensure that we prepare the trial balance. So that's basically it. So these are known as the accounting records. Okay, folks, the journal ledgers and trial balance are basically known as the accounting records, which are used to prepare the financial statements. Okay, folks, so we are ensuring as to whether the accounting records, which is basically the journals, ledger and all other records are accurate as well as complete. Is it, uh, it is, are the financial figures accurate and have we, uh, you know, recorded everything that there is to record. That's basically what we're ensuring here. So keep this in mind. And then we move on to the third objective. What is the third objective then? Well, we basically ensure that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework okay folks so these are basically the three objectives of an audit first of all we have to ensure as to whether the financial statements provide a true and fair view secondly we make sure as to whether the accounting records are accurate and complete and thirdly we ensure as to whether the financial statement has been prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework okay folks and this might be different for different organization operating in different countries as well isn't it because in some uh, some states or some countries not states <laughs> some countries we have local accounting regulations which we have to comply with and lo local reporting uh, uh, regulations as well so that's basically the case okay folks we have to make sure as to whether the org organization sorry or, or the audit client is complying with the uh, local jurisdiction or not okay folks are they preparing the financial statement in accordance with the ifr standards the ia standards etc that is what we are ensuring here simple as that moving on let's take a look at the material real quick yeah that's basically what what we discussed okay folks so let's take a look, uh, look at it real quick the objective of an auditor is to state an opinion as to whether the financial statements give a true and fair view the accounting records prepared by management who is the uh, people who prepare the accounting records this is the auditor no not really isn't it so it's the management and uh, we have to ensure that these accounting records are accurate as well as complete okay folks and then we should also ensure that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework in all material respects okay folks so to put it in a bit more simple words uh, we should make sure that the financial statements are uh, uh, prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework in every way. That's basically it. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what in all material respects mean. Now, so that's all for the objectives of an audit. Now, moving on to the next topic that is concept of true and fair view. Because we just discussed that one of the objectives of the audit is basically to provide or uh, yeah to provide as to whether the financial statements provide the uh, provide a true and fair view isn't it so what exactly does true and fair view mean let's take a look at that shall we so what does true mean first of all true indicates three things here 
information is factual and conforms to reality okay folks so have we recorded the transactions uh, exactly as to what has happened within the organization that's basically one thing and it should be facts which me basically means that uh, we should you know record the truthful aspects uh, and we should reflect the reality in that okay folks that's basically the case secondly it complies with accounting standards and any relevant legislation okay folks so have the particular financial statement that we prepared have we complied with all the financial standards that are relevant uh, here in that for that particular organization or have the uh, particular financial statements be prepared uh, according to the uh, relevant legislation in that particular jurisdiction so all these things are uh, confirmed in the true aspect and what else truth also uh, true also implies that the data is correctly transferred from the accounting records to the financial statements as well okay folks we are also ensuring as to whether the uh, data the financial data has been transferred from the accounting records which is basically the journals ledgers and trial balances appropriately to the financial statement that is the sopl sofp etc okay folks so keep this in mind that's basically as to what true means first of all is the information factual and confirmed to reality secondly the accounting standards does it have any uh, sorry is the is, have the particular accounting uh, have we complied with the accounting standards or any relevant legislation and uh, have the has the particular data been transferred accurately and appropriately from the accounting records to the financial statement that is what we confirm uh, when we talk about true okay folks that is the concept of truth here what about fair what does fair mean fair basically means that the information is clear impartial and unbiased okay so what does this mean well this basically means that the, whatever information that we state in the financial statement should not be influenced by anyone okay folks that's basically it so we have to state everything in a truthful manner isn't it so it should not be influenced by anyone or you know provide overstated figures things like that should not happen within the financial statement that is what has been stated here and another aspect to it is that the uh, it should reflect plainly the commercial substance of the transaction now what does this mean in accounting we always learn that uh, whenever we record a particular transaction in the uh, journals ledgers and other financial records we should always uh, reflect the uh, commercial substance of that transaction rather than its legal form isn't it so that's basically the same concept that what has been explained here okay folks when we mean fair we mean that the particular transaction that we have recorded should reflect the commercial substance rather than its legal form so uh, substance over form so remember that concept okay folks so that's basically it okay folks that's basically as to what true and fair view is all about quite an easy set of topics isn't it so remember this we will use this very term quite frequently throughout the syllabus okay folks so keep this in mind and now let's move on to another topic shall we so folks now we will be learning about the types of assurance engagement we already know that assurance engagement is a broad concept and external audit is basically a type of assurance engagement isn't it so let me just write it down for you we have assurance engagement at the top and then there are three types of assurance engagement that we will be mainly focusing on first of all we will be learning about external audit which we already did isn't it we learned as to what it is however this particular external audit is further classified we will look into that but before that another type of assurance engagement that you will learn about is internal audit there is that and this is way different from external audit as well so keep that in mind and then we also have something called review engagements as well okay folks so that's basically the three types of assurance engagement that we will learn throughout the entire syllabus of w so keep this in mind now what i want you to understand here is this what is external audit this is basically when an auditor who is an external who is someone who is external to the organization examines the financial statements and provides an opinion as to whether the financial statements provide a true and fair view and what else there's also another thing as well isn't it they also make sure that the financial statements in all material respects is uh, prepared on the basis of the applicable financial reporting framework as well they look for uh, misstatements and errors etc as well isn't it so keep this in mind that's basically what external audit is all about now 
External overhead can be classified into two categories as well. We have statutory audits as well as non-statutory audits. So what are statutory and non-statutory audit? As the name suggests, the statutory audits are basically audits that are mandatorily required by the statute or by the law. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And what about non-statutory audit? Well, these are basically optional audit. If you want to conduct an audit, then you can. It's not mandatory. That's basically the difference here, okay, folks? Then we have internal audit and uh, we will look into that. We will look into internal audit in a bit more detail in another session. However, we will look at it, uh, the basic concept as to what it is. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, another aspect that you have to understand here is regarding review engagements. Okay, so what exactly is a review engagement and how is it different from external audit? So in external audit, what do we do? We uh, take a look at the financial statement as a whole and maybe the accounting records as well if, if we have to further investigate into it and then provide our opinion, isn't it? That's basically as to what happens in an external audit. However, when it comes to a review engagement, we may not conduct as much audit work as what we would conduct in an external audit. Okay, folks, in an external audit, we provide something called a reasonable assurance. Okay, folks. However, in a review engagement, we provide something called a limited level of assurance. Okay, folks. That's basically the difference here. Now, there are various types of review engagement. So let's uh, take a look at a few. We have due diligence reports or due diligence review. Then we have social and environmental reports. Forensic audit. Sounds kind of cool, isn't it? And some other types of audit as well. Okay, folks, we will take a look into that. Now, let's take a look at the material, shall we? So we first of all have external audit and what is an external audit? Well, that's something that we have been discussing again and again for a lot of time now, times now, isn't it? So in an external audit, an auditor states an opinion as to whether the financial statements provide a true and fair view. The most simple definition of an external audit as simple as that. And then there are two types of ex external audits that is statutory audits as well as non-statutory audits. In statutory audit, what would happen? A statutory audit is when entities are required by law to have an audit. It is mandatorily required by law for some companies to conduct an audit in an annual basis, okay folks, on, on every financial year. That's basically as to what a statutory audit is. Then we have some more points provided here. Let's take a look. This includes public companies, large companies, building societies, charities, financial institutions, etc. Okay, so these are the types of organizations which, which mandatorily require a particular uh, audit in their financial years. Okay, folks, so we have public companies which are basically partially government, partially or wholly government owned companies. Then we have huge companies, large corporates, MNCs, etc. Building societies are basically a group of companies that is commonly found in the UK. And then we have charities, which is basically, uh, you know, there are some money laundering and other related risks relating to charity. So we, they are, uh, you know, they have to mandatorily conduct an audit regarding that and then we have financial institutions well obviously banks and other commercial uh, you know financial institutions would defin definitely have to conduct an audit since they deal with cash and other finance finances isn't it so that's basically it and yeah and certain other companies as well okay folks that's basically some of the more most important uh, organizations which mandatorily require an audit as simple as that and then we have a non-statutory audit okay so in a non-statutory audit, there is no legal requirement to conduct an audit. Okay, folks, if we want to conduct an audit, then we can. Otherwise, it's not mandatory. Okay, folks, that's basically the situation here. For example, a small company may or may not conduct an audit. Now, why do I say may or may not? Because conducting an audit does have its own benefits, isn't it? So we will take a look into that. But what you have to understand here as of now is, Small companies may not have the sufficient level of resources in order to conduct an audit, in order to mandatorily conduct an audit, okay, folks, which is why they are exempted from, uh, from uh, as per the Companies Act. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. Now, let's continue reading. 
This is done because they find it beneficial due to the following reason. So why exactly uh, are small companies, uh, you know, are why exactly are they willing to conduct an audit exactly? Let's take a look at that, shall we? The owners of the company, that is shareholders, will have a great deal of confidence on the financial results of their business as they provide a reliable information. So audited financial statements would provide more reliable, more, rely more reliability than uh, unaudited financial statements, isn't it? So that's basically the case for you folks. So conducting an audit uh, for on, on an organization would increase the reliability of the financial information that they provide. So that is one of the reasons why even small companies would be willing to conduct an audit, you folks. And secondly, it provides an assurance to those financing the business, example, banks, you folks. So the financial information, okay, folks, if the reliability of the financial information is more uh, increased by conducting an audit, then that would also increase the level of confidence of both the owners, as we discussed in the first point, as well as for the finance providers, as we discussed in the second point. Okay, folks, who are the finance providers? Basically, the banks who provide loans to the business, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically it. Thirdly, it makes the FS or financial statements look more acceptable to tax authorities as well. Okay, folks. So since the financial information is a bit more reliable, the tax authorities can also rely on the financial information provided by the uh, small businesses as well. Okay, folks, because even if the business is small, they still have to pay the taxes in it. So that's basically the case. Finally, it helps to make the sale of the business easier as it provides the buyer with reliable financial information. So, if you are planning on selling our particular organization to another, uh, uh, let's say, investor, but then de definitely that particular investor will have to take, will definitely take a look at the financial statement, the statement of profit or loss, uh, calculate some ratios, and assess uh, the financial information. Isn't it? So definitely, if the financial information information is more reliable by conducting an audit, then that particular buyer would also be a bit more confident in purchasing the particular organization okay folks so we can increase the level of confidence of the intended users so who are the intended users that we've stated here first of all we stated uh, uh, something regarding the yeah owners of the company we uh, looked at the financial finance providers of the organization the tax authorities as well as the buyer of a part or a potential buyer of a particular business okay folks that's basically the thing okay folks so we will be able to uh, satisfy the, the financial information needs of these users by providing reliable financial information by conducting an audit. That's basically the situation here. Okay, folks, that is exactly why a particular organization would be voluntarily willing to conduct an audit. Now, moving on to the next concept that is internal audit okay so we have mentioned this particular term quite a few times now so what exactly is internal audit all about so folks what exactly is an internal audit and how is it different from an external audit let's discuss that shall we so when we talk about in external audit first of all this is something that is conducted annually as we know in every financial year by large organizations etc we've learned about that and what exactly do they do they provide an independent external auditors provide an independent opinion on the financial statement isn't it so remember that keyword here okay folks so independent opinion i want you to focus on the term independent here how exactly are they independent they're independent because they are not employed by the organization or they don't work within the uh, organization or within the audit client. Okay, folks, that's basically how external auditors are different from internal auditors. Because when we talk about internal auditors, these are basically a group of audit team that is basically employed by the organization and work for the organization loan. Okay, folks, that's basically the situation of an uh, internal auditor. So keep this in mind. So this is how it is different. External auditors are basically external to the organization and internal auditors are employees of the organization. So keep this in mind. Okay, folks, yeah, both, both of them almost do the same functions. However, when it comes to internal audit, they do something more as well. Okay, folks, what is that something more? Let's take a look at that, shall we? 
The internal audit function performs assurance and consulting activities designed to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of the entity's governance, risk management and internal control processes. So this is what the internal, sorry, internal auditors do, isn't it? So what exactly or how exactly is it different from external audit? In external audit, our duty is to provide an opinion on the financial statement as to whether the financial statements provide a true and fair view, isn't it? However, when we talk about internal auditors, what do they do? They provide assurance, yes, on the financial statement to a certain extent. Uh, however, there are also certain other activities as well. Okay, folks, they provide consulting activities. They uh, evaluate the processes, operations, etc. Especially internal controls. That's a primary prop focus for the internal auditors. They focus on the internal controls within the organization and improve upon them. So what are internal controls? That's another question that can arise, isn't it? So internal controls are basically some control measures that we have within the organization you know, to prevent uh, or detect fraud and error activities. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what, what internal controls are. We will look deep into that. Uh, so what you have to understand as of now is that the internal auditor's function in, involves evaluating and improving the effectiveness of the entity's governance. So what are, what are governance? When we talk about governance, we talk about corporate governance. Okay, folks, this is a basically a system by which an organization is directed and controlled. So we evaluate that and we identify certain risks and manage them. And then uh, we also look at internal control processes as well. Okay, folks, we evaluate the operating effectiveness of internal control systems within an organization. So these are some minor activities conducted by the internal audit function. Okay, folks, they also have a number of other assignments as well. So what all assignments do they have? There are a number of assignments that may be carried out by the internal auditors, and these include value for money audits okay folks there is something called value for money audits if you've sat for any other papers in ACC you may know as to what value for money is isn't it so when we talk about value for money we have to consider the three A's that is economy, economy efficiency and effectiveness okay folks so uh, so we conduct an audit by focusing on these three aspects that's basically what uh, value for money audits are and then we have information technology audit, which is basically an audit conducted on the IT systems within an organization. And then there is best value as well as financial, operational and procurement audits as well. Okay, folks, best value audits are kind of common for uh, internal auditors to conduct. In best value audits, we focus on primarily two aspects. That is, we focus on things like the governance of the organization and maybe resource management as well, okay, folks. Basically, the value adding activities of an organization, okay, folks, we take a look at as to whether we are managing our resources effectively or uh, is, is the government governance policies that we have appropriate and are the individuals within the organization following those policies, etc. So these are the things that we uh, look at when we conduct an best value audit and then we have financial operational audit which is basically financial audit is something that we already looked at that is basically taking a look at the financial statement as to whether the financial reporting process is appropriate or not and uh, are we complying with all the relevant standards etc operational audit is basically an audit conducted on the business processes and operations within the organization and finally we have procurement audit as well procurement audit primarily focuses on uh, contract management okay folks or uh, we're focusing on contract procurement. What is the pro uh, contract procurement process? Have we recorded everything appropriately relating to acquiring contracts, things like that? Okay, folks, that's basically as to what a procurement audit is all about. So keep this in mind. So these are some of the examples of activities conducted by an internal audit team. So keep this in mind. Okay, folks, this is how uh, the primary difference here uh, from external audit is that internal audit team is employed by the organization. Internal audit team is basically the employees of a particular organization. Whereas external, what about the external audit team? Are they employees? No, not really. Okay, folks, they're just hired to conduct the audit. That's basically it. Okay, folks, we don't hire them as employees, but rather they're an independent audit firm who just provides us with the opinion. That's basically it. And primarily hired, they are hired by the, uh, primarily the shareholders and sometimes the directors. We will look into situations that, like that as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, 
that's basically as to what internal audit is all about. Now moving on to the next type of assurance engagement that is review engagements. Okay, so what are review engagements are? What are some examples? Let's take a look at that, shall we? In review engagement, the auditor provides limited assurance over the subject matter and obtains less evidence than required by the audit. Okay, so we don't contact as much of an audit work as what we would do in an external audit. However, we do provide a limited level of assurance to a certain extent. Okay, folks, now I want you to focus on the word here, limited assurance. What about in an external audit? So what kind of an assurance do we provide in an, in an external audit? In an external audit, we provide reasonable assurance. Okay, folks, reasonable assurance to the intended users, obviously. Okay, folks, and we might do the same in an internal audit as well. However, one of the limitations of internal audit is that they're employed by the organization, isn't it? So their superior is basically the management. So therefore, to a certain extent, they won't be independent enough. They have to be independent, yes. However, there is a risk that they may not be independent since they are employees of the organization. So that's a risk there, just mentioning that. Now, uh, coming back to the assurance aspects, in an external audit, we have reasonable, we provide reasonable assurance. What about in review engagement? When we talk about review engagements, we provide limited assurance. Okay, folks. So when we talk about the levels of assurance, we will look into that. Uh, what exactly are what what how many levels of assurance are there? Let's take a look, let's talk about that a bit briefly, shall we? Levels of assurance. So first of all, let me just demonstrate that in a particular graph right here. Now, first of all, there is a situation where you provide 100% assurance. Okay, folks, we call this absolute assurance. Okay, folks. And then we have reasonable assurance which is kind of lower than absolute assurance okay folks so less than 100 percent this is called reasonable assurance and then we would have limited assurance which is less than uh reasonable assurance this is basically limited assurance okay folks so that's basically as to how the levels of assurance work we have absolute assurance we have reasonable assurance and then we have uh, limited assurance as well now what you have to understand here is that in an audit be it external be it internal we do not we cannot provide 100 percent assurance or absolute assurance anywhere okay folks keep that in mind because there is always a risk of uncertainty or always an element of uncertainty while conducting the audit procedures as well isn't it so that's basically the case here okay folks we cannot provide a hundred percent guarantee that the financial statements are free from material misstatements etc because there is always an inherent risk there okay folks which is exactly why we only provide a reasonable assurance in an external audit so remember that okay folks that's a really important point we cannot provide an absolute assurance so keep this in mind now <clears throat> uh, then we have limited assurance isn't it so in a review engagement what do we do we only provide a limited assurance so keep that in mind let's just quickly come back to the material there we go the reviewer will provide an opinion and it will be stated in a report just like in external audit uh, that th that particular process is uh, common in both these methods and we do provide an opinion and we do provide that in a particular report as well. However, the opinion that we provide will only have limited assurance. Okay, folks, that's basically it. This report will be commissioned to those who assigned the reviewers their job. Now, what does this mean? Well, just like how we have the responsible party, uh, that is the management and external audit, there will also be someone who assigned the reviewers their job, isn't it? So the report will definitely be addressed to those people okay folks so 
Well, this, this could be the management at times or it could be the shareholders, it could be anyone. In an external audit, who is the people who assign the uh, particular uh, auditors their job? It would primarily be the shareholders of the organization or the investors of, of the organization. Okay, folks, remember that. Not the management, the investors. Uh, now, coming back to the review engagements. In review engagements, the particular uh, people who assign the jobs to the reviewer can be anyone. Okay, folks, it could be the management, it could be another investor, or it could be it could even be the shareholders as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, some examples of uh, review engagements are provided here. We have risk assessment report as an example. So, what is this? This is basically when you assess the risk of the organization. Okay, folks, that's the only thing that you do here. However, if you're let's say conducting an audit, you're doing everything that is stated here, isn't it? So. Uh, you will be, you know, conducting the risk assessment, you will be taking a look at the uh, financial statement and if you identify any, uh, you know, something fishy from the financial statement, you may further look at the accounting records and maybe even the internal control system if that is deemed to be necessary, etc. Okay, folks. However, there are certain engagements where you only conduct certain aspects of the audit. For example, a risk assessment report that's basically you conduct a risk ass assessment of the organization and prepare a report on it that's basically it secondly we have review of internal controls so rather than conducting an entire audit we might just only take a look at the uh, internal controls and assess its operating effectiveness okay folks so whenever you hear the words internal control this keyword should come into your mind that is operating effectiveness what exactly are we ensuring by reviewing the internal control we're ensuring as to whether the internal controls are operating effectively Okay, folks, there are a lot of keywords that you will learn throughout the syllabus, so keep these in mind. Okay, folks, moving on to system reliability reports. Okay, folks, these are basically some reports regarding certain systems. Okay, folks, it could be IT systems, it could be, let's say, uh, revenue record, uh, recognition system, something like that. Okay, folks, there are a lot of systems within the organization, isn't it? such as information systems, etc. So, we are basically uh, conducting an audit on these systems as to whether these systems are operating as they are intended to as simple as that then we have due diligence review now this is kind of an interesting concept okay folks so let's say that i am planning to invest in a particular organization or i'm planning, planning to purchase a majority shareholders of a particular organization i would definitely have to identify as to whether i'm investing on a safe company isn't it or, or does that particular company that I'm planning to invest on, does it have any future prospects or does it have a growth potential? Now, in order to identify, in order to answer these questions, what I would do is I would hire a group of auditors to conduct something called a due diligence review. So in a due diligence review, what happens is the auditors will take a look at the organization, its functions, its future prospects, etc. and recommend certain information to me through their report. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what would happen in a due diligence report. So the people who hire uh, the particular reviewers here are basically investors. Okay, folks, and then they, uh, they uh, you know, advise the reviewers, advise the investor as to whether the organization have any growth potential or do, uh, is, is the management appropriate or the or systems operating effectively there, etc. All these things, okay, folks. So that is basically as to what a due diligence review is. So keep that in mind. And then we have social and environmental reports as well, which is basically an audit conducted on the social and environmental uh, information published by the organization, okay, folks, or within the organization itself. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what a social and environmental report are all about, as simple as that. So we're not focusing on the, if you are, let's say, conducting, uh, let's say, a social audit or an, or an environmental audit uh, using a group of reviewers. You won't be focusing on all the financial aspects, okay, folks, because you're not conducting an external audit here, isn't it? You're just looking at the social information, the, uh, the environmental information that has been provided and taking a look at as to whether these information are accurate and uh, yeah, these are appropriate or not. That's basically it, okay, folks, as simple as that. Now, that's basically some examples of review engagement and in all these engagement, we only provide limited assurance. Now let's dig a, let's dig a little more deeper into that particular concept of limited assurance, reasonable assurance, etc. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at that. <clears throat> so now we are looking at levels of assurance. 
So folks, we talked about three levels of assurance, isn't it? There is the absolute assurance, the reasonable assurance, as well as limited assurance as well. And we also learned that absolute assurance is just a myth, isn't it? That's basically clear. We cannot provide an absolute assurance while conducting an audit. So keep this in mind. Now, what exactly is the level of assurance that we provide during an external audit? The uh, reasonable assurance, isn't it? What about in a review engagement? In a review engagement, we provide limited assurance. So let's take a look at us what the difference between these two exactly are in a bit more detail, shall we? Now, what exactly is stated here? First of all, let's take a look at the difference of each of these assurance on the basis of conclusion, shall we? So for reasonable assurance, we draw reasonable conclusions and for limited assurance, we draw limited conclusions as simple as that. Well, that was kind of obvious, isn't it? So what exactly are we talking about? We're, hit, we're talking about the conclusions provided after the review or audit of a particular financial statement or any other subject matter. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what we're talking about here. So in the case of reasonable assurance, we provide reasonable conclu conclusions, whereas in the case of limited assurance, only limited level of conclusion is provided over the subject matter. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. What else? What should we ensure about the subject matter here? In the case of reasonable assurance, we have to confirm that the subject matter confirms in all material respects to, of course, the applicable financial reporting framework, yeah, depending upon the engagement. If it's an external audit, then definitely we have to provide reasonable assurance that the subject matter, or in the case of external audit, the financial statement in all material respects is, is in accord, prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework, isn't it? So that's basically the case. What about in the case of limited assurance? Subject matter is plausible in circumstances. So what does that mean? What does uh, plausible in circumstances mean here? Well, when we talked about reasonable assurance, we basically mentioned that the subject matter should confirm to the applicable financial reporting framework or any other framework or criteria in all material respects or in every way, isn't it? That's basically what is meant here. However, when it comes to limited assurance, we're saying that there is still, even though we haven't identified any crucial risk or any mistakes, there is still a possibility that there could be something. Okay, folks, that's basically the uh, attitude or uh, that's basically as to how the uh, subject matter or the, or the particular basis on which the conclusion is provided for a limited assurance is seen. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. What else? <clears throat> then we have the assurance level. Reasonable assurance is a high level assurance. However, when we talk about limited assurance, it's a moderate or low level assurance, which we kind of figured when we looked at the diagram, isn't it? So remember that. And then we have quantity of procedures. Okay. So in order to provide a reasonable assurance, we have to conduct thorough procedures. Okay, folks, that's basically one thing that you have to remember in the case of reasonable assurance. However, when we take a look at or when we have to provide a limited assurance, what should we do? We should just conduct a few procedures. That's basically it. Okay, folks. So we don't have to conduct uh, as much uh, of an audit work as to, as to what we would conduct in an actual external audit. Okay, folks. That's basically the case of providing limited assurance. Fewer procedures here. What else? Then there is the wording of the conclusion or the opinion that we provide. We provide an opinion in both the cases in it, be it an external audit or be it a review engagement. However, the wording of the opinion would be different here. Okay, so uh, in the case of a reason, when we are providing reasonable assurance, our opinion should be positively worded. Okay, folks, the opinion should be positively worded. Now, what does positively worded mean exactly? So, well, let me show you an example right here. In our opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view fairly in all material respects. So simply stating that is basically, you know, providing a, a positive uh, impact of, of to the level of confidence of the intended users in it. So that's basically the case here. Okay, folks. So we are basically mentioning that 
uh, for, in our opinion, the financial statement is prepared well, good, really good in all in every way. Okay, folks, as per the uh, applicable financial reporting framework, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically what has been mentioned here. However, when we take a look at limited assurance, so how exactly is that word, the opinion of for a limited assurance worded exactly? It is negatively worded. Now, what does negatively worded mean? Does it mean that we will always provide a negative opinion? No, not really. Okay, folks, so what exactly uh, is an example here? Let's take a look. Nothing has come to our attention that causes us to believe that the financial statement are not prepared in all material respects. So both of these opinion uh, means the same thing, isn't it? However, one is positively worded, which can provide us with a higher degree of confidence, whereas the other is negatively worded, which will provide us with a limited amount of confidence. That's basically it. Okay, folks, that's basically the difference in wording here. Okay, folks, the first one, we will, you know, have a higher degree of confidence, whereas in the second one, that is for limited actions, what are we saying here exactly? We're just mentioning that, okay, so we have conducted a few procedures. However, nothing has come to our attention, isn't it? So that's basically all we're stating here. However, uh, when it comes to reasonable assurance, we can confidently say that, okay, from our thorough procedures that we've conducted, we were able to identify that uh, the financial statement has been prepared in all material respects to the applicable financial reporting framework, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically the difference in wordings for each of these uh, assurance levels. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So, that's basically the difference between reasonable as well as limited assurance, to put it very simply. Now, Moving on to some general principles for an auditor to follow. Now, this is kind of easy, okay, folks. This is basically three things that we have to focus on here. So, when we talk about the general principle, we basically talk about three things, okay, folks. Now, these are basically the rules and regulations that the auditors must comply with. So what all rules are we talking about here exactly? Well, we are talking about, first of all, the ethical principles, which we will learn in quite a bit of detail in the next few sessions. Now, what exactly is ethics? Ethics is basically doing the right thing, isn't it? So if we, are, if we have to provide an opinion on an organization's financial statement, an independent opinion at that, we would definitely have to comply with a lot of ethical principles, okay, folks, so in order to make sure that we do not have any personal interest or uh, we're not influenced by the organization, the audit client, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what ethical principle is all about. It's all about doing the right thing. So the auditors will have to comply with the ethical principles, which means that whatever they do, they have to do the right thing. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. Secondly, we have to comply with something called ISAs. Okay, so what are ISAs then? ISAs are basically international standards on auditing. Okay, folks, just like what we have IFRS and IAS, which is basically the accounting standards in auditing, we have uh, ISAs, okay, for international standards on auditing. So that's basically it. Now, these are basically guiding principles of best practice. That's basically it, okay, folks. And then the third thing that we have to do is we have to maintain professional skepticism maintain professional skepticism so what does skepticism professional skepticism mean here exactly well to put it very simply it's ba basically having a questioning attitude okay folks or a questionable mind mindset it's all about being alert to condition that might indicate a particular error or fraudulent activity from happening within the organization okay folks so we have to always be alert for uh you know as to what can go wrong okay, for, the, for the things that can go wrong while conducting the audit that is basically what maintaining professional skepticism is all about as simple as that okay folks so three principles first of all the ethical principles and then the audit standards which is isas and then we should also maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit okay folks that's basically it so these are the three general principles let's take a look at the material real quick the auditor must comply with applicable ethical principles put forth by the professional body okay folks so every auditor would certainly be a member of a certain professional body of chartered accountancy and 
uh, they have to comply with the ethical principles provided by the professional body itself. And of course, there is also an organization known as the IESB. Okay, folks, IESB is basically the International Ethical Standards Board. Okay, folks, as simple as that. So we have to comply with those principles. And in our case, who is our professional body? It's our professional body is ACCA, isn't it? So we have to comply with the ACCA's Code of Ethics and Conduct as well. Okay, folks, so these are the two things that we have to comply with mainly and of course if there are any ethical principles provided by the jurisdiction of a particular country we have to comply with those as well isn't it so remember that so we have IESB principles as well as ACCA code of ethics and conduct okay folks now what else do we have Secondly, the auditor must comply with the International Standards on Auditing or ISCs. And another thing that you have to understand here is that <clears throat> we talked about IFRSs. We learned about IFRS and IAS standards, isn't it? Which is basically the accounting standard. Who is it published by? It's basically published by the International Accounting Standards Board or IASB. So just like that, in auditing, we have an IAASB as well. Okay, folks, so ISAs are mainly published by IAASB. And what do you think the full form of this would be? Obviously, it's International Audit and Assurance Standards Board, as simple as that. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. And finally, yeah, the auditor must keep an attitude of professional skepticism. So this, is a, this isn't something that we buy from a particular store, isn't it? So it's an attitude that we have to keep up throughout the audit process, okay, folks, while planning and performing the audit. So throughout the entire audit process, you have to maintain, you have to be alert to conditions that might indicate an error or a particular uh, fraudulent activity from happening within the audit client. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what professional skepticism is all about. So keep this in mind. So that's all for the general principles for the auditors to follow. As simple as that, isn't it? Simple things to remember. Moving on to the benefits and drawbacks of auditing. And as I mentioned earlier, everything has its own pros and cons, isn't it? So let's learn the pros and cons of auditing in a really interesting way, shall we? So first of all, let's talk about the benefits of auditing, shall we? So when you talk about the benefits of auditing, first of all, this mnemonic should, should come into your mind, that is HIRED. So what does HIRED mean here exactly? H here stands for high quality information, which is more reliable, improving reputation of the company in the market or industry. So what's the idea here? Since we are conducting the audit on the financial statement, on the financial information of the organization, the financial information is a bit more reliable to the intended users, isn't it? So since that happens, as an impact of that or as a result of that, the reputation of the organization would also increase as a result and they would have a great market standing or a great reputation in the industry. Okay, folks, that's basically the first point. And then we have I. What does I stands for? I stands for independent scrutiny and verification may be valuable to management. So what does independent scrutiny mean here? This basically means that an independent group of people would come into the audit line and take a look at their financial statement and report and provide their opinion on it. Isn't it? That's basically the process of external audit, isn't it? So this is basically an independent scrutiny because we have an independent set of people, basically the auditors, coming into our organization, taking a look at the financial statement and providing us with the feedback as to whether there is any problems within the financial statement. Is there any errors? Is there, was there any fraudulent activities or manipulative activities within the, within the financial statement, etc. So therefore, this particular feedback might be seen by, seen by the management as quite useful, isn't it? Because they can improve the processes the next financial year, isn't it? So that's basically the case here, okay, folks? So the independent scrutiny, uh, which is basically done as part of auditing, would be seen as valuable by the management of the organization. Okay, folks, that's another benefit. What else? Then there is R. R stands for reduces the risk of management bias, fraud, and error, which is kind of obvious because while conducting the audit, we would be able to identify certain errors that may have uh, been within the financial information or uh, we could identify certain fraudulent activities or manipulative or creative accounting from the financial statement. So these things, okay, folks, these, things, these things can be identified from the financial statement itself 
the people within the organization would be a bit more careful when preparing all this, isn't it? So they would make sure that everything is prepared appropriately so that the auditors should not have to point out anything. So that's basically the case here, as simple as that. Then we have E. E stands for enhances the credibility of financial statement, for example, for tax authorities and lenders. So what's the idea here? Since we have more reliable financial information, a lot of stakeholders such as the tax authorities as well as the finance providers will be able to rely more on the financial statements of the organization with a higher degree of confidence, isn't it? So that's exactly what has been stated here, simple as that. So there is an increase in credibility of the financial statements and what else? Then we have deficiencies. D stands for deficiencies in the finance internal control system may be highlighted by the auditor. Okay, so the auditors will highlight deficiencies within internal control systems, okay, for or limitations of the internal control systems and point it out to the managers. Now you might think, isn't this the function of an internal auditor rather than an external auditor? Is it? No, not really. Okay, folks, because the external auditors would also do the same process. When? Well, this is basically when the internal control system, what exactly, or why exactly are we using the internal control systems for? This is basically so that there is no, uh, it is basically to prevent or detect fraud or error, isn't it? That's basically the case there. However, if let's say that due to a deficiency in the internal control system, there has been a misstatement in the financial statements, then the auditors will, the external auditors will take a look at the internal control systems as well, okay folks, as to whether they operate effectively. If they operate effectively, then we can, then the auditors can rely on them, isn't it? However, if they're not operating effectively, then we can't really rely upon them, isn't it? So we have to do further procedures for the testing regarding a lot of systems as well. Okay, folks, that is basically the idea here. Now, that is basically when the external auditors would review the internal control systems. Okay, folks, so keep that in mind. If it leads to a misstatement in the financial statements, remember that. That's a really important point. Now, that's basically all about the benefits, isn't it? So H-I-R-E-D, so keep this in mind. Now, moving on to the drawbacks of auditing. Okay, so what exactly are the drawbacks here? So the drawbacks of auditing can be learned using the mnemonic FIRED. Okay, so what does FIRED mean here exactly? F stands for financial statements include subjective estimates and other judgmental matters. So what this means is that the financial statements can contain certain accounting estimates which are basically which are basically calculated using a high greater degree of judgment isn't it for example the depreciation calculation maybe the useful life of certain uh, assets or maybe the fair value of certain assets etc so all these things are determined using a certain degree of uh, judgment professional judgment by the management or by experts etc so as auditors, we would have to conduct an audit on them and make sure as to whether these estimates are appropriate, isn't it? So there is a risk that we may not be able to provide such an opinion, isn't it? So that's basically the case here, okay, folks. There are some inherent risks within accounting estimates. So we may have to work more on accounting estimates, conduct more procedures over there and obtain more evidence in these situations, okay, folks. So that's basically the case that has been stated here and one of the limitations of audit, okay, folks. So even though we can't, we may not be able to provide a higher degree of assurance over accounting estimates and judgmental estimates within the financial statement. That is one limitation. Secondly, I, I stands for internal controls may be relied on, but they may have their own inherent limitations. So as I stated earlier, the particular set of auditors, external auditors may be may rely on the internal controls of the organization after reviewing it or they may not. However, every internal control has their own inherent. So well, well, now I'm not going to say every, but yeah, some internal controls may have their own inherent limitations. Okay, folks, so that's basically something that the auditors will have to consider while conducting the audit, isn't it? If they do not consider, then they may provide an inappropriate opinion. So that's basically the another risk here. So keep this in mind. And what else? So we can't really blindly rely on the internal controllers and we have to conduct a few uh, tests regarding the internal control systems within the organization as well. So remember that. Then moving on to the next letter, that is R. R stands for 
representations from management may have to be relied upon as the only source of evidence in some areas. So folks, as I stated earlier, there are certain judgmental figures within the financial statement, isn't it? such as depreciation, the useful life of assets, the uh, fair value of certain assets, financial instruments, etc. Okay, folks, so the idea here is this. How exactly can you obtain evidence that these figures has been uh, appropriately calculated and these figures has been determined using an appropriate basis? Well, we can primarily do two things. First of all, what we can do is we can recalculate the figures once again using uh, the same approach as what the management did and confirm the accuracy of the figures. Or secondly, we obtain something called a written representation from the management. Okay, folks, what's the idea behind this? This basically means that since we cannot, you know, conduct, we cannot obtain more evidence in some areas, what we do is we obtain this written representation. So what is a written representation? To put it very simply, it is basically an acknowledgement from the management stating that whatever they've done in these judgmental areas have been done appropriately and in accordance with the relevant rules and regulations or standards. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what a written representation is all about. We will, of course, dig a little deeper into this particular aspect in another session. Okay, folks, so don't worry about that. Now, uh, that's all basically as to what uh, this particular limitation is. Okay, folks, in some areas, the only thing that we will, able be, we will be able to obtain is basically the written representation. Okay, folks, nothing, nothing more could be done other than maybe recalculations or things like that. Okay, folks, that's basically it. That's another limitation. And is this sufficient evidence enough or is just obtaining the written representation sufficient evidence? No, not really, isn't it? So we've learned that the evidence should be of a sufficient and appropriate nature. So just obtaining a written representation is not sufficient evidence. So keep this in mind. What else? Evidence is often persuasive, not conclusive. Now, what does this mean? Well, the idea here is basically this. The evidence that we obtain may be able to persuade a particular individual into thinking that whatever has been done within the financial treatment is right. However, is that actually the case? That's basically the question here to put it very simply. Okay, folks, that's basically it's persuasive rather than conclusive. Simple as that. And finally, we have D. D stands for do not test all transactions and balances. The auditor tests on a sample basis. So sometimes we may, we may not be able to test every transaction because nowadays every organization will have millions and millions of transactions occurring within the organization, isn't it? So does the auditor have the time to look at each and every transaction and provide an opinion on it? No, not really. So therefore, what we do is we take a something called a sample. Okay, folks, so from the 100% population, we might only test like 20 or 25%. That's basically it. Okay, folks, so the risk here is that there is something called a sampling risk. Now, what is that? We might test a few samples. However, is that sample representative of the entire population? Now, that's what we call a sampling risk. Okay, folks, so that's yet again another uh, really important risk or limitation of audit. Okay, folks, since we are taking samples, our opinion may not be that accurate. However, we are getting over this particular limitation uh, using a lot of uh, data analytics techniques, etc. Okay, folks, so keep that in mind. Now, so that's basically all about the benefits and drawbacks of audit. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Moving on to another topic that is accountability stewardship and agency so what are these terms these terms could be useful into writing your answer okay folks so which is exactly why we are learning these concepts so these are quite the basic concepts isn't it so first of all what is accountability all about well folks the principle of accountability is basically seen in a superior and subordinate relationship okay folks you have the superior here as well as the subordinate So folks, the idea here is this. The superior is the one who has the authority to make decisions, isn't it? So what they would do is, they might delegate the authority to their subordinates at times. Okay, folks, so that's basically the situation what you have to consider here. A superior is delegating authority to their subordinates. So in such a situation, wouldn't the subordinate be answerable to the superior for their actions so that's basically the case of accountability okay folks it's basically when the subordinate is uh, accountable for their actions towards the 
particular superior. That's basically the situation here. So keep this in mind. That's basically as to what the principle of accountability is all about. Let's take a look at that, shall we? Accountability means that people in a position of power can be held account held to account for their actions. That is, they can be compelled to explain their decisions and can be criticized or punished if they abuse their position. So what's the idea here? This is basically when someone who has a certain power or authority is accountable for their action. That's basically it. Okay, folks. So let's take a look at an example in a company context, shall we? For example, in the context of a company, it means holding the directors answerable for explaining their actions to the shareholders. Who are the shareholders? Shareholders are basically the owners of the company, isn't it? And who are the directors? Directors are the people who are responsible for running the company, isn't it? So if they don't run the company appropriately, then who are who, who are the directors answerable to? They are answerable to the shareholders, isn't it? So that's basically just another example to demonstrate the principle of control, accountability. Okay, folks, so keep, the, keep this in mind. Now, moving on to another simple concept known as stewardship. Okay, so what exactly is stewardship all about? Stewardship is when a person is responsible for taking care of something on behalf of another. For example, the directors of a company have a fiduciary duty to safeguard the assets of the company for the shareholders. So that's quite a fairly an easy concept, isn't it? This is basically, uh, you know, taking responsibility of safeguarding something on behalf of another. In the case of a company, we can say that the directors have a fiduciary duty to safeguard the assets of the organization on behalf of whom? the shareholders, isn't it? So keep this in mind. So that's basically as to what stewardship is all about. Fairly an easy concept. Then we have agency. What is agency relationship? In an agency relationship, we again have two individuals here, isn't it? So we will have the principal and an agent. And we know that the agent will act on behalf of the principle that's basically as to what the agency relationship is all about isn't it that's basically as to what agency relationship is now in the case of an organization or a company who exactly is the principal here and who exactly is the agent the principal in a particular company would be but before that it's basically principal okay folks so keep this in mind now the principal in an organization would basically be the shareholders isn't it who are the owners of the company and the agent is would, would be the directors of that particular organization okay folks so the directors will act on behalf of the shareholders and run the company effectively that's basically the case here however there's another a concept that you have to learn as well that is known as the agency problem now what exactly is the agency problem so in order for the agency relationship to work out effectively, both the objectives of the principal as well as the agent should be the same, isn't it? So agency problem arises when the objective of the principal and agent are different. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what an agency problem is, to put it very simply. As simple as that. Okay, folks, now let's take a look at the material regarding this, shall we? So agency. An agency occurs when one party, the principal, employs another party, the agent, to perform a task on their behalf, okay? And in the case of a company, the directors, which are the agents, act on behalf of the shareholders, the principal. And when there is a difference in objective of the principal and the agent, then there arises something called an agency problem. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what agency relationship is, as well as as to what agency problem is all about as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And the end of this particular topic marks the end of this session as well. Okay, folks, so we have laid out the basic foundation of the audit paper and we will learn how to apply the knowledge that we've learned in these sessions in our question marathon where we will practice both the uh, past paper questions as well as we will also learn how to tackle questions in the CBE environment as well. Okay, folks, so stay tuned for that. I will see you later in another session where we will be learning something new. Okay, folks, till then, this is Vishnu Vijay signing off.